Good afternoon. It's so nice to be here. Um, thank you for coming to our session. My name is Paolo Pristini, and I'll be your active moderator. And um, we're here to kind of discuss interdisciplinarity and where it intersects with identity and collaboration. Um, before we start, I just want to get a sense of like how many people in here are kind of you know still in school or artists and kind of out in the world. This is going to kind of affect how I how I present. Can I get a show of hands? Okay, and presenters? All right, so we have, okay, that's good. That helps me out. Okay, so um, I guess I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of our incredible um, panelists. Uh, so I'm a composer and I work in really often in very deep interdisciplinary settings. Uh, from operas to kind of genre-defying works, and I take that collaboration to also kind of create systems. So I have an uh, interdisciplinary production company that does my own work, and then also founded a place called National Sawdust, which is in Brooklyn and is all about collaboration and sound. Um, so I really kind of see these all as like kind of composing a world. Um, we're gonna get into like a little bit of also just like how, um, later, a little later I'll get into how I break down the kind of processes of collaboration, but I'm gonna introduce our guests. So um, here, uh, I'm just gonna start with Jenny, actually. Um, so Jenny Coe is a brilliant violinist, commissioner of series, multimedia artist, um, and really known for kind of breaking, I think, you know, not breaking, but expanding what it means to be an interdisciplinary artist today. And uh, she's also just became the director of the Florida's Chamber Music Series at the Kennedy Center. Then we have Jaron Herman, uh, who really lives in the liminal space of uh, being a dancer, choreographer, director, writer, and activist. Um, his work, Vitruvian, is traveling the world. He's in the internationally renowned ensemble uh, Kinetic Light, um, which actually just had a huge performance at the Shed. And he and I are collaborating right now on Sensorium X, which is an opera where he's the choreographer and associate director. And then we have Gabe Cabezas, who is an incredible cellist, interdisciplinary artist, and collaborator with roles in Y Music and Duende and countless other collaborations. He's also a Sphinx Medal of Excellence winner. So um, this is our incredible kind of group of, of people who I really, I'm, I'm just very excited because I think they really represent the future in terms of how do we bring interdisciplinary thought into the way that we work and how does that really help us kind of expand our forms and really refine what we need as we travel into this world as independent artists. Because often collaborations, whether they're in music or outside of, you know, kind of intersections with other disciplines, really help us rethink issues such as IP, contracts, rights, so on and so forth. So we're gonna get into that a little bit um, more. And I guess maybe I'll start, um, let's see, maybe I will start with um, Jenny. Uh, so Jenny, I wanted to talk a little bit about like the way you've built your career because I think it's a really brave way to build a career. Um, I often think that, you know, when you think about interdisciplinarity, it's so much about your identity and, you know, like how do you mix, you know, where you are in your life your identity, your collaborative process, and how that kind of representation builds into your choices as a, you know, as a curator and as, um, as an artist. Um, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about how identity has shaped um, your career, um, how, you choose this, how you choose projects, um, and anything else that kind of fits in there. That's like an entire life question. Yeah, I know, um. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So, um, okay, well, in terms of education, these, purely musical education uh, or otherwise. I got an undergraduate degree at Oberlin College for English literature, and then I went to Curtis, and then I went to Marlboro Music Festival. So in a sense, I guess I started out maybe not in the most traditional path, um, but I felt like that was a great opportunity um, to kind of, uh, not only grow up as a human being, but it was a great opportunity to see how other fields analyze the past and analyze the canon. Like, so for example, with um, literature, you, you wouldn't just read things as people would have read them in the time period, right? You always have, whether it's a feminist, colonialist, historicism, um, post-structuralist way of analyzing and, and reading past works. Um, and that's not necessarily something that's done in, in classical music, I think, very often. Um, and then I had some of the most traditional training possible at, at Curtis and Marlborough. Um, 
And then you ask a question about how does identity become expressed in projects. Um, so I, I was, my, both my parents were refugees during, during the Korean War and also my father who was a bit older than my mother lived under, through essentially World War II and then Korean independence, which then went into the Korean War. Um, so I guess I, I founded ARCO Collaborative, which is really about highlighting and bringing forward artists of color because there, weren't, there wasn't space and there weren't institutions that, that were commissioning and funding those projects. Um, so I realized I had to create something outside in order to make those projects happen. So that was kind of the beginning. And you mentioned I, I just became artistic director um, for the Florida series at Kennedy Center, which was unexpected um, and will be interesting because I'm used to really working outside of, of institutions. So I'm excited um, about being able to advocate for for other people and the artists I believe in um, and having funding of another institution. So I'm not like, okay, $100 here, $100 there, um, and try to raise all this money. Um, and I guess the most recent project that ARCO did was um, called Everything Rises with Devon Times in which we really brought our familial experiences and, and our experiences actually specifically as artists of color um, in classical music and um, kind of bringing, I guess our audiences, well we made the decision to not make it an easily, um, not make it a happy uh, story that was all tied up in the end. Um, and so it's not, it's, it, it was a good opportunity to realize that sometimes it's important to present work in which you're not liked, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, and it was interesting because then the next week I played Tchaikovsky concerto and everybody was like, ah, um, because it wasn't comfortable, right, to um, present Everything Rises. And I realized, oh my God, playing Tchaikovsky as a performer or to just only play the classics, it's like opium mm. for performers because it's like everybody just loves you when you do that stuff. And I was like, oh, that's why people don't do that as, this other stuff as much because it, it's, it's um, uh, well, sometimes it's important to make work that, that people don't necessarily like. That's, that's not necessarily the, the um, gauge for, I think, for art that kind of activates the mind and um, kind of confronts, asks your audience uh, to confront kind of preconceived notions of what they have. Um, and I think it's important to fund work like that as well, because otherwise we're missing out on, on stories of other people. It's really our loss. In the Absolutely. End. So, I so just want to take one thing um, you said, you know, just because institutions are people. And I, I think like what's really exciting about your entering that kind of you know, curati curation in a large institution sphere is that I think often those kind of points of intersection are where great change can you know, make place. Um, because at the end of the day, they need you, you know, and they need your experiences and they need your voice. Um, so it's going to be exciting. I, see. I, I mean, really what I, I see it as is an opportunity to give a platform to other people. Yeah. Because I've been lucky enough to be able to have a career. And I actually think artists um, are the most interesting people. <laughs> and, and I'm more interested in a lot of ways of hearing their ideas because mm -hmm. uh, I already know what my own ideas are. And then I learn from them. Mm -hmm. um, and then hopefully I can make work that's more interesting yeah. from having learned about their stuff. It's a regenerative cycle. Okay, um, Jaron, just a, a couple questions for you. Um, I was wondering if you could break down some of the steps that you've taken to become this kind of Renaissance human. Uh, that you are, and also, you know, just how you've dismantled and assembled systems in order to be the kind of artist that you, you want to be and you are and, and that evolution. Well, thank you. I'm really grateful to be here. Um, I think that just being here is uh, indicative of the friend economy <laughs> and the other, like, tiers of, uh, of engagement that are open because of relationship. 
And I just want to, oops, sorry, I'm, I want to acknowledge that. And I think, to your point too, Jennifer, like this idea of everything rises, like I love that um, as, a, as, a, as something to hold to, uh, not only as a piece of work, but also as this credo, you know, that um, once you get somewhere, it's to open a pathway um, and to, yeah, literally open a pathway. Um, my experience <laughs> kind of was, was compelled. I was compelled to think about breaking systems. I come from um, the world of disability and dance. Um, I grew up with a, with a disability and was diagnosed when I was like three months old. So there wasn't a lot of like, you know, typ typical frameworks for me from the get-go. From the get and the performing arts was always the uh, container that I felt like I could always tell a story. Um, fold myself into, find find my way through the canon and out, out of it. And so I was already kind of uh, uh, contrarian and like, you know, anti-establishment um, because there, you know, when you talk about having a seat at the table, it's like, well, I can't even get to the table because there's 17 steps to the table, you know? So there's like, there's a, you know, physical access being kind of another point of like why people don't show up. Um, and so I, yeah, I, 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 str I strive to just like be a part of projects that were um, captivating to me individually from we heard from the last panelists in the last uh, session about like finding your own curiosity and I was really compelled by my own sense of what I was drawn to and not allowing that to be um, like hidden or otherwise dampened. Um, I just thought, okay, that I'm, I'm led by my by my interests, um, and that just leads me to really exciting places that feel authentic and feel like I can um, add to them. Um, I do have still like kind of typical ambitions for prestige. <laughs> I still want that coin and, you know, uh, prize, <laughs> you know, prizes and whatnot. But I think that's also kind of um, changing in the sense that I don't think that, that what's, that's what makes me or what otherwise uh, dictates my growth in the art. Um, it's the projects. It's like I'm really enlivened by what kinds of things I'm a part of, um, which include writing, um, even modeling has this kind of practice, or otherwise being a representative for brands, having a practice of, of showing yourself. Um, certainly on stage works um, are my favorite. And so I think the steps I take to get to there are um, keying into what I'm interested in, finding um, authentic collaborators and folks that I vibe with. Um, and then I look to what, a, what, a, what, my, uh, what my artistic qualities are that can fit with that project and or that space. And just a question about how you choose your collaborators. Like is there, like are there any kind of, you know, methods in terms of, of, of building that trust or do you have any kind, have you broken it down any ways or is it really like an internal compass? Yeah, it's, there isn't much of a science, I don't think. I think um, opportunity and, uh, and proximity are really big in my world. I think as a counter to the hyper connectivity that we have with social media and everything, I, I'm kind of drawn to like who's in my immediate sphere that I might not have seen before. And that's, I feel like a really nice kind of counter, uh, counter way or way of countering what I'm expected to do as a millennial. Um, so I look to like my, my locals and my, the folks around me. Um, but I, I have DM'd Moses Sumney to be like, can I, can I use some, one, of your music, one of your pieces of music? Uh, so I'm good with this kind of expansion of, 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 you know, of who to collaborate with. Um, but it is, it is instinctual, I think. It's, um, and then I, I give myself the grace to like say they can change, you know, like I have an instinct or initial desire to be with someone and then it could evolve as the relationship does and I allow that to really take root and be okay with the changes of that and not expect it to be everything all at once. Absolutely. You and I, uh, we've talked a lot about how collaboration, like you have to give it the time it needs and you know, that's one thing for, for anybody in the audience who hasn't kind of done like a lot of deep interdisciplinary work, um, some of the rules that I like to follow are, are basically, you know, just 
you have to kind of, the more solid you are in your musical identity and your voice, the more depth you end up bringing to the collaboration. But the issue is a chicken and egg thing because with interdisciplinary practice, you can only learn by doing it. And often you don't learn that in school because there are no courses, or if there are, it's one class. And so it's really the kind of thing that the more that you collaborate, the more that you do interdisciplinary work, the more you cross disciplines, the more you start to understand how it actually deepens your, um, your artistic practice and the way that you see things, which is really exciting. Um, I tend to, I'm just gonna take a second, I tend to break it down into like three ways of, um, of dividing work. And it's always malleable because different collaborations take different processes. But um, the first thing is really kind of when you choose a collaborator and choosing that collaborator is, is a big thing because it's partly instinct, you don't know how it's gonna go. Um, and it's also about respecting each other's ideas um, and knowing which ideas you don't want to let go. But that first, that first step is really kind of encounter and commitment. And in that, you're really kind of establishing check-ins. Um, you're making sure that it's the right time for you to embark on a big interdisciplinary project. Um, you discuss views like, you know, on life. It's kind of a check-in. It's like a basic check-in on, like, what does equity mean to you? You, you know, are you friends? Are you not friends? You, you establish essentially codes. Um, you discuss views on intellectual property because when you're collaborating, all of a sudden, it's not just your own, right? It's now something that's actually shared. And so you really have to understand deeply what that means. Who's a lead artist? Are you aligned? Um, and if so, then you commit. And then that next phase, phase is really exploration and negotiation. So there you're talking about how you're gonna work, you're establishing communication, roles, responsibility. Um, contend with what success looks like for you in a partnership. What does success look like? And how are you gonna deal with failure together? What does failure mean? Um, and then um, documentation, right? You're always documenting your process because that's actually how you can look back on what you've done and really learn. And then finally, you're in composition and production. And now you have this clearer idea of your project. All along, you're kind of trying to bring in funding. And um, at this point, you're, you're really thinking about the language to describe your project. And you know, I could go into much more detail, but I'd say that the most complex collaborations, which Jaron and I just experienced because we did an opera in South Africa, is when you're really dealing with intercultural work, right? because then you're really talking about an experience where you're not just learning about each other's craft or art, but you're learning about each other's culture. You're doing so in a place like where we were, where all of a sudden the power would be shut off for six hours a day. How does that influence the work that you do? You know, and you have to enter these processes again, you know, understanding that what you think it's gonna be may end up being completely different, and that's a tremendous gift. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna get to you, Gabe. Um, let's talk a little bit, I, I love thinking about your career in, in the sense also of how collaboration has influenced you as a cellist, you know? And like, what are these processes that you go through? I love Jenny when you were like, you know, I'm doing this project and then I go play concerto. And like, I think we all balance, you know, really intense collaboration um, with then projects where you need to be more internal because collaboration is such an extraordinary um, practice and it's a practice of giving. So maybe talk a little bit about the collaborations that you're in, how this kind of back and forth influences your cello playing um, and maybe talk a little bit about Lost Coast. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I really, hearing from, from the two of you, there's a lot, a lot of overlap in everything that we do, especially uh, coming in and out of uh, traditional backgrounds and working with Canon and working and finding just the collaborators that you want to uh, work with. Um, it's such a big thing. It's very much, again, like the friend economy and just finding your people. Um, so that's been a, a big part of my life. I um, also uh, went to the Curtis Institute of Music and to Marlboro Music Festival. And so that, that was a very, um, uh, traditional way of, of learning how to play the cello, and I have a background in all of that, but I found uh, in that time that I was really interested in uh, working with, especially with composers and generating new work, um, but also I started to dip my toe into a little bit working with uh, non-classical artists. I play in a sextet called Y Music uh, out of New York, and we, uh, the genesis of the group was actually being a sort of pocket orchestra for uh, different uh, especially indie artists in uh, New York, uh, so that you could have a little bit of strings, you could have you know some horns, you have a little bit of winds, uh, all this kind of thing. And so uh, working with them uh, has been amazing uh, because you just learn to experience music in a totally different way. So when thinking about how that's changed me as a cellist, you know, I am able to bring sometimes a little bit more of uh, an aggressive, a groove or something just to be technical about it back into the cello playing or you learn how to uh, approach 
uh, analyzing music in a different way because if you're you know learning a song or whatever and you're like okay this is the form this is how it goes this is where you have to be really tight this is where you can sort of experiment a little bit with what you're doing there's a lot of that that you can bring back into your into your concertos and you know so that uh, you give a little bit of something new um, to Tchaikovsky and to Brahms and, and to all that and that has really actually sustained my interest in classical music, if we're going to be honest, uh, really being able to, to give, uh, to create, I don't know, a whole musical world for myself and uh, grow as an artist with each one of these collaborations. Um, so that, that's one of the things that I do, but uh, Lost Coast, uh, which Paula mentioned, is an album that I put out last year with a, a great friend of mine from Curtis, actually, uh, the composer Gabriella Smith. He's a wonderful um, composer and, and one of my best friends and uh, f first friend actually at Curtis. And uh, so we actually had the idea of making a, a kind of an untraditional classical music <laughs> album when we were back in school and it just took us about 10 years to make it. And the it's essentially layered voices, cellos, uh, violins, which she, she plays, and uh, different found percussion uh, objects that we, we ended up uh, using at the, the studio where we recorded. Um, the album and the the music is all based around uh, different experiences that um, that Gabriella has had in in nature. That's a big theme in her work, but Lasco specifically uh, the trail in um, the Pacific Northwest in California, uh, and that music is just really interesting and exciting to me because it, it lives in this world where it is sort of classical. You can pick out, oh yeah, like this feels like contemporary classical music, but we also sort of structured it thinking very much about um, the other kinds of music that the two of us are, are interested in in mind. And uh, we, we were just really excited, excited to uh, work in that sort of in-between space where, you know, oh, is this like a piece? Is this, you know, what is this? We don't really know, but we're gonna find out eventually. And <laughs> actually, uh, coincidentally, part of the album is uh, Gabriela is finishing, I think, today and adapting into a, a cello concerto. So um, we're looking forward to bringing that to life as well. And that kind of ability to have multiple modes of dissemination, is that something that you think about in all of your works in terms of you know being able to have more performances? Or do you think like certain things really need to be one thing? Well, yeah. I think actually for me, um, something that I'm really interested in right now is that like multiple modes of dissemination. I'm really interested in right now in, in projects that can live in a recorded state, in a live state, in a couple of different kinds of live states, maybe in a way that uh, is focused, maybe has more of a visual focus, um, you know, making uh, videos as well. You know, it's uh, ma making something uh, is such an opportunity, right, in music, because we're so used to reproducing. But when you make something, you get to control how people uh, experience it to some extent, or not, if you choose if you choose to. So uh, there's just a lot of uh, opportunity to create um, things that will live on in as many ways as your brain can uh, can come up with. I love that, and then how that affects the form and performance practice, you know, for for further generations. Jenny, I want to get back to something that um, you were talking about, um, just getting a little deeper into the process of kind of putting together a work and something like Everything Rises. And for those that haven't kind of, you know, had that experience of, of really seeing something from the beginning to the end, can you give us a snapshot of how your mind works, both from the kind of curation angle, but also the kind of, as a producer? Um, you know, what, what, what are your responsibilities? Or if you're, you know, working with collaborators, like, how do you envision that? Um, well, first of all, I think what's important to me uh, is to always work with people that I think are better than me. Um, people that I think I can learn from. And that's made for the best collaborations, I think, in general. Um, I will say that making these works, um, just even, I'm talking just on the creative level, takes years and years. Um, making Everything Rises took seven years. Um, this work six solo uh, with Robert Wilson and Lucinda Childs that took 10 years to make um, until from the idea to um, development to finally the first performance. Um, and I don't know if this is, because I know uh, I've been seeing a lot of students. Um, so one thing I do want to say to you guys is that 
to always keep faith because every single project I've ever come up with, people have said that will not work. That will never work. Nobody wants to see that. Um, so I think one of the most important things to keep in mind is that if you really believe in this work um, and you, and also I, that's, this is the other thing, um, is if the mission is larger than just the stuff that you wanna make, if you're actually looking to start something so that you can inspire other artists to make work that hopefully is better than the stuff that you're doing actually, um, and to be able to create space and to make a new space um, for people to be able to um, have voice. That's, that's the most important thing. So I, what I would say is that every single project um, that I've done is hopefully um, to create an impetus for other artists to be able to use that as the starting point and then you hope that they'll take it to a new and better place, actually, ultimately. So in a, in a way, I kind of think of all of these things as um, service, a point of service. So how do you serve your larger community? How do you give voice? So Everything Rises was actually one of the first times I was giving voice and gave myself the agency to speak about my own experience. Everything else kind of before that had been advocating for people, other people, right? Even ARCO Collaborative was al always about advocating um, for other people, other artists of color, um, women, composers, you know. Um, so the thing that was interesting for me for Everything Rises was that was really the first time I um, maybe even gave myself the permission to, to tell my own story and my own experience. Um, and it, it I hope it won't take other people as long as it took for me um, to feel that I had that um, agency to be able to, and that it was actually even relevant uh, that anybody would be interested in it. Um, and that even to some degree that I had the right to say my own story because, you know, I had, um, I mean, look, I love, I do love, of course, the canon and a lot of what, um, you know, doing new music has, has felt liberating for me to reapproach older music. Um, oh, what was the question? You, you answered all of it. And I, I just want to catch on something oh, about... No, you did. It was beautiful. And, and this idea of this, I'm hearing a refrain of creating space, right? And I think, you know, we're here because we love the canon, but often the reason you create space is because you don't feel that you're being heard, you're not represented, you don't see yourself, and so the only way to, to, to do something is oh, to yes. create so space. Yeah, so for the future of music to even happen, like, first of all, I don't believe in genre at all. I think you have either great artists or mediocre artists or bad artists. Um, and it, it doesn't matter, like, the word genre in music, it doesn't matter if they're a choreographer, a director, dancer, it doesn't, it, like, you just have great artists and not good artists. Um, so, you know, in terms of that, I, I don't see any kind of lines between that. And so, um, those inspiration, but, okay, if we deal specifically with, like, what, what everybody here we're calling kind of classical music, um, I don't think the art form's gonna, like, be able to survive if it doesn't include everybody's voices now. I, I mean, from, from the very beginning when I started, everybody was saying classical music is dying. And, you know, a lot of, of course, we think about that, but then you have to think about, so what are we doing to actually listen to and bring the voices of others in our community into this? And so into this field of classical music. So it, in a sense, if you look back in history, of course, yes, the art form started in Europe, but then that's not who we are. So how do we counteract that? It's only by commissioning new work. It's only by really actually advocating um, for people of color because we, <laughs> we exist in this world. Um, and, and also, if you think of it globally, we're actually the global majority, right? So how is this art form even gonna exist 
if we don't include these voices and, and stories. And, and also, I find it so much more interesting to hear stories that I haven't heard. And I think, and that's the thing, as people of color in classical music, we've had to do that the entire time. Like, none of us are white, none of us are male, <laughs> you know, um, and that's, you know, who, who the composers are. So certainly if we have the ability to do that, then, then there should be that human ability and capacity to be sitting in an audience listening um, to a story that's not, not their, you know, their own personal experience. So speaking of, of you know, manifesting stories on stage, John, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that we're just embarking on, Sensorium X, and it's really about, um, you know, seeing disability in the sphere of opera on stage. And I just want to ask, you know, because so much of the conversations we're having are that a lot of the contracts, a lot of the spaces, a lot of the kind of rubrics that um, we're entering don't really exist to accommodate, um, you know, new ways of doing things. Can you talk a little bit and then we will get to Q&A. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, just really quickly, I think um, Sensorium has this uh, ability to approach the venues, the funders, um, the audiences with an approach, a kind of a holistic approach to viewing new work so that we're from the get-go saying um, you enter into this environment that is geared toward care and toward rigor, but rigor not at the, s for the, s at the sake and at the expense of a human, you know? And so with that uh, being central to what, how we developed this piece, um, we're kind of saying to uh, industry that um, work doesn't have to be uh, at the expense of like humanity. Um, and I think what we're finding too is that the vehicle of work, the vehicle of a piece can also be a catalyst for change, um, add spaces, and and offer new perspectives and new mo modes of working uh, for organizations. So that I think, you know, because it's easy to, I mean, it, it not, it's not easy, but within, I, within the, um, the consulting and kind of counseling work that many fabulous people do, it doesn't always translate to the work, right? And so for it to actually be pieces that are, enca are encapsulated like Trojan horses that go into major opera houses, major theaters, and then glitch, you know, actually glitch their systems, um, that's really impactful and powerful. And so I'd like, I'd like more to see that more, like that work embedded um, changes perspectives of like how to work with POCs, how to work with indigenous communities, how to work with women-led you know, uh, projects and disabled-led projects. Thank you for that. And you know I have a whole thing on Trojan horsing, which I is that I'm like dying to say, but I think we have gotta get to Q&A. So um, I'm gonna, let's, uh, yeah. Are there any questions? <laughs> Hi, I'm Brianna Garcon. I'm the current engagement liaison here at Sphinx, and I'll be reading some questions from the Q&A portion on Hopin. And I encourage all of you, if you do not feel comfortable, to come up to the stand to put your questions here, and I will read them. Liam McConnell wrote, what advice would you have for students who would like to create interdisciplinary collaborations outside of the music school? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, okay, I'll just say that sometimes you think that you have to do things outside of the music school, but really you can take the resources of your school to do your own project, and it can often be a great bridge. So you're doing that, um, you know, if it's a safe space, in a place where you're able to kind of use certain resources. Um, I started my whole career in the in the basement of, of, of churches in New York City um, because I just I knew that I wasn't going to get opportunities as a woman composer at that time at Juilliard. Um, so literally the next 15, 20 years, I was building a, a career in collaboration because that's where I was going to get my commissions. I was going to self-commission. I was going to find my way. Um, so I think the main thing to, th to know is that um, the, the act of collaboration is communication. And so what you do have is you have friends, you have um, people who you know, and each little thing is a concentric circle that keeps expanding, and you keep expanding a universe. As that universe expands, your heart expands, your capacity expands, and then other people find you attractive and they start to commission you. I didn't get my first commission until I was almost 40. Um, that doesn't mean I wasn't working. 
So the thing to remember is if you don't fit in a system, it doesn't mean you're not successful. You're just not successful in the eyes of people who are building systems that often look like power structures that are white. Um, but you can build it. So I don't know if, I hope that answered your question. Are any answers here? No? That's it, that's it. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, my name is Suli Nirio and I'm the founder of the Afro Latinx Sign and Opera Project. I was here in the last meeting, so what if you were here, y'all already know. Um, I, I uplift existing historical works of Afro Latin folks and also do commissions that tell the story of Afro Latin folks from their own lens. And um, my question or comment has to do with, I actually want to hear more about that Trojan horse because um, I sometimes get resistance for my project because people have a conception of Latinidad that doesn't include blackness, okay. when in reality there would be no Latinidad without blackness. And um, how do I, I do do lectures in the scholarly aspect of my work, but how do I get, um, folks to, I guess, buy into my existence, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. Sorry, I didn't no, mean to get that heavy. That's but. really powerful. I'll, I'll just say that the Trojan horse thing, right, is that often when you're working in a system where you're not heard, um, you Trojan horse things in order to be able to make them happen. So you work within systems to be able to have an eventual goal in mind. Often, I found that in my life when I did that, I was, I was younger and I just, I didn't have the tools to be able, or, or even I hadn't built, if you will, the experience or, or the name to be able to name things. Um, but now I'm at this point where I'm not willing to Trojan horse things anymore because what happens is if you don't name what you need and what you want, in the end you pay for it anyway. Um, and so now I'm just trying to be really intentional about like, no, this is who I am. This is what I need. And some people we were talking about today, some people will just not see you. And that's painful, but it's not your job to make people see you. It's your, you know, it's your job to exist, to manifest that existence and to try to find bridges. Because we can't convince people, not all the time. <laughs> I just want to say that, um, I know one can feel very alone, but I hope you know that you are very beloved by your community of artists. So I know that oftentimes we're working in spaces in which one might feel direct. Um, what I don't know if you call it microaggressions or whatever, or, or, or you're not given these kinds of opportunities, but I do hope that, that everybody here realizes that they actually are loved within the community. And if we can hold that inside, even through the most difficult times, because there are difficult, hard times. And um, I think that that, you know, it's a marathon. Our lives are marathons. And it doesn't matter if your success is today or if it was yesterday. What matters is your whole life. You know, so whether it comes, like Paola had mentioned, she hadn't gotten her first commission until 40, it doesn't matter if somebody gets their first commission at 10 or 15. What matters is your entire life. Um, are you doing and making the things that you love? Um, and so, yes, so I think it's, I, I hope that you can feel that, and because I know, y you know, Myself, everybody else, you, what can I hope help you endure is that um, there are people that, that really do value you and do love you. Hi, thank you. Um, just want to say thank you for saving the space to be, to allow for vulnerability and for you to share all of this. It's, it's really nice. Um, my name is Devin. Pinzo, um, I'm an oboist, producer, and I'm also artistic administrator at the San Francisco Opera. And on the topic of vulnerability, I'm curious if anybody has a, a story they're willing to share about a time a project didn't come to fruition or that they had to take a step back from a project because something wasn't working. And how do you rebound from that? How did you 
use that as a, a learning experience so that you can approach view it or approach it a different way f so that it could be successful in however iteration uh, okay i have a i have a bunch of failures to draw and i'm happy to <laughs> to share <laughs> Um, I had done this piece in New York City at PS122, and I was so excited about this piece. And Philip Glass came to see it, and I was like, oh my god, this is it, it's my break. He's gonna tell me I'm amazing, and it's gonna be great, and this is my moment. So he said, let's have, let's have breakfast tomorrow morning, I wanna talk to you, and I was like, great. So I went to have breakfast, and he was like, that was terrible. Mm. And he said, you're carting around a community, and you're not taking your artistry into consideration. And it was just like this moment where I was like, holy shit, like I'm building the system before I built myself. And it was really profound. Um, I couldn't take it though. Like I ended up, like it was a confluence of things and I ended up taking a year off of music and I had a child and then I came back. And like when I came back, I began to realize that like centering yourself sometimes in processes. And you understand when I say this, I, like I've built a space, I've built programs for women and marginalized genders, like I believe in give back. But if you don't care for yourself and you don't center that wellness and you don't stand up for yourself and you only think about others, you lose yourself along the way and you have voice, right? You have, you know, you have something special to give. So that moment was really critical. Um, it was really critical for me, yeah. I mean, that, that's exactly the same. I think it is exactly that, like when you, you find that you, have to step back because you yourself aren't uh, being pushed forward or otherwise taken care of. Uh, that's the only experience I've had where and I've had to say so long to a piece or or uh, step back from a commission or something like that, which I'm like only 10 years into my career and so every commission is like valuable to me. I, I don't have the, I don't feel like I have the ability to say no, but so the one time that I did, I mean I bawled for a good two days about like, with the fear of like, what did I do? How could I say no to this? Also this like idea of like, the reason why I did were because of, I, I didn't think that they, this commissioner had like, um, uh, aligned with my sense of work, and my sense of labor. So I was saying, taking a stand and like, they didn't meet me where I met myself. So, um, so then if I had said yes to that, I would have shifted my sense of self and my sense of labor and, and allowed someone else to take advantage after that, you know? So it was a domino for that. It was that moment, it was a make or break, you know? And I knew that if I accepted that then, I would accept it forever. So it was nice to set something in the sand for me. Were, were you talking about it falling apart between artists or like an institution? All of the above? All of the above? Well, I w one thing I would say is if it's an artistic and creative idea, it's always your own. And so whether it happens, you know, at that time that you, you thought was commissioned and all set in stone, um, that, I, you know, creativity and, and what your mind makes, what your heart makes, what your body ultimately creates, I guess if you're a performer <laughs> or, or, yeah, that never goes away. So that same piece might happen 10 years later. Um, so you haven't actually lost it, in a sense. Um, I love that. And again, oh, go ahead, Gabe. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to, uh, I was just going to agree. There's this, I think, sentiment that we have up here that we immediately understand the sort of, oh my gosh, like this work didn't work out. That is a personal failure because of our identity as artists. And that's building sort of a <laughs> protective layer for yourself to, to be able to step back and say, you know, I still am who I am, and I have my whole life to make this or to not make it, if I so choose, is very important. Also, sometimes failure is just because the system isn't ready. And like that's actually really important to notice is that sometimes you're building something that like systems are just not ready for. But that doesn't mean that it's actually not changing the system. You just don't see it until later. And that's actually, the, that's hard, right? Because you're not reaping any of the benefits of that effort. You, you don't see it, but it does systemically slowly change. We have, I, th I think we have to believe in this idea of like upward mobility. Um, yeah. We have another question submitted through Hopin anonymously. It states, 
What are some issues that you have to navigate in curating or performing interdisciplinary performances? Well, <laughs> uh, there are issues uh, just around finding the right space and the right time, I think, is, is um, uh, the, the most important. You know, not every project is for every um, scenario. And so adapting or creating something uh, that fits a certain opportunity, I think, is, is really important. And if you're creating something from scratch, whatever it might be, um, to have in mind sort of the what does the finished product look like and then looking for those, those opportunities, how, how they might find you. Uh, ends up, at least to me, being very, very important, you know, to really fit fit your own brief, in a, in a sense. I'm talking too much, I'm sorry. Um, I, I uh, one of the things, I'll just confess, is that, you know, I, I had mentioned before that every, every project I had wanted to do, people said no. So I started out my career because I had won the Tchaikovsky competition, right? So then everybody just thought I was a Tchaikovsky player. And then I wanted to do this project called Bach and Beyond, and I was told nobody ever wants to hear you play Bach. And I was also simultaneously doing a lot of new music. And then suddenly I became only a new music player. And then I wanted to do this other project called Bach, uh, no, Bridge to Beethoven, where I felt like, okay, this is the time that I feel like I can do um, all ten Beethoven sonatas, and I was told nobody wants to hear you play Beethoven because you're not a Beethoven player. <laughs> so, you know, kind of what you guys had asked before, it's really hard, of course, to separate who you are um, when people are saying these things. My new resolution is not to work with people who scream at me. So I, I think I'm doing good so far, like in January. Um, <laughs> But it's hard sometimes, right? And, but what could, with Bridge to Beethoven, what made it, when, when people were telling me that, I was like, you know, this is really about re-examining this idea of placing these composers on pedestals, that they're not even human beings, that this will forever be in a museum and anything else is like lower, then and and that's the only thing of value, you know. And if you're not, if you don't happen to be of that, you know, ethnicity or like you, there's no way you could possibly play this music. And and the number of times I, I hope the fields changed since then, but the number of times that I've been told um, that oh, there's no way you could ever understand Bach or Beethoven or Schubert. I mean, you're Chinese and you studied in America and you don't speak German or whatever. And, and <laughs> this person, one specific person, he actually had finished conducting a Tchaikovsky symphony. I was like, oh, so you speak Russian? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> you know, so it was, it's, I guess all I'm saying is, it, basically it has to be a lot of stubbornness, um, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, and, um, and eventually, what I hope is other people will, will believe in themselves earlier than I did, you know? Because people ask me, like, oh, did you just know you were going to be a soloist the moment you were born? And I was like, no. I graduated from Curtis and had no idea if I could make a career in this field. Um, I'm absolutely, I was not one of those people. Um, so I feel like a lot of the questions we're getting are about vulnerability and how to be yourself. Um, within a field that doesn't actually necessarily want you to be there. And one of the great things, I mean, this is the first time I've been to Sphinx, and it's so nice because, like, nobody doesn't want you to be here. <laughs> um, so it feels like a totally different space. And that was true about everything where I says, actually, you were asking about collaborators, so I, I did have, we had a, a, a changes of collaborators. Devon and I were always, um, we were the co-creators of the work. Um, but our team ended up being a team of all people of color and it, it just changed the entire dynamic of everything, actually, because there was we didn't have to explain anything. <laughs> Everybody just understood. Um, but you know, specifically we were that piece is dealing with race. Um, so it it just was actually even more efficient. But it was just felt safer in the end.
Okay, I'm gonna not talk. Thank you. Them. No, that's great. I think we have a question. Go ahead, Justin. Hi, my name is Joseph Matthews, and I'm the Director of Impact and Inclusion at the Memphis Symphony. Uh, my question is, uh, what strategies or entry points would you suggest for introducing uh, interdisciplinary collaboration at traditional arts organizations? <laughs> Do you want me to take that? <laughs> Go ahead, Dron. Um, I, I've always been fond of featured, like, uh, or even, s I've, I've been energized to see, like, a season um, or a program do something quite um, extraordinary or out of the ordinary alongside a kind of typical season to like make a statement about that piece or that that artist that they've invited um, as a signal of like this deviates or this also I, I like when curators actually know the legacies like we talked like the last session there was this idea of like we we jump from you know uh, classical modernist to like you know contemporary so quickly that we don't have anything in between and so for someone to make the gap or to make the the bridge um, in curation is really exciting and that's I think a really big way that organizations can introduce new work um, I think excerpts are are deep and big actually like there's a I I, I think I've found that you know, when you're invited to bring a snippet of something, you know, it, it, it begins that kind of conversation and that relationship to bring a fuller piece, maybe. I think also getting them to create, you know, like I think one of the things, one of the experiences I loved was when I was working at the New York Philharmonic in education, we went down t um, to El Sistema and worked with kids, but the kids had never been taught composition. And I was like, what do you mean? like? Like, how can you not teach composition? Like, that should go hand in hand. Um, and so we did. We, we ended up, like, really working with them. And what was really great is to kind of think about the physicality of space. So, like, I think especially when you're talking with kids, you want to think about, like, horizontal and vertical. So that immediately, like, puts you into the, to the, the, the space of a timeline. And having them really kind of understand composition and creativity and putting their hands on it mm -hmm. and actually creating something physical in space. And then, like Jaron says, examples, you know, like representation, visualization but also creation, I think, really immediately gets them into the possibility of what they can do and what they can make. Hi, another question just came in from Hopin Anonymously. It states, there aren't much works that allow people of disabilities to be a part of. How do you create space for people of disabilities to find their own voice? What would it look like to redefine performance? Mm. Mm. Wow. Um, is that to me? <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> um, no, so... I, one of the things around interdisciplinary work is that um, incumbent in it is looking at the dimension of space so that the interdisciplinary work has to fit into somewhere that it wouldn't nece necessarily always fit in. Um, so we're already thinking about a categorical shift. So when you're, I think for artists with disabilities, um, interdisciplinary work is probably more likely in the wheelhouse we're in text and because also uh, for everyone, the, uh, you know, the advent or the inclusion of access um, in pieces such as ASL interpretation, captioning, um, uh, audio description, tactile, um, uh, tactile pieces that correspond with, with the work, these ideas of, of, of sensing and, and extra sensing um, for people with, with different sensations um, also adds to the, the artistry of the work. So m invariably making it interdisciplinary because we're touching on so many different other silos and disciplines already. And if you're, if you're collaborating with people with disabilities, um, I think that that has to be, you have to, you have to build that from the get-go. I mean, we discovered that in Cape Town wherein um, our design was, of our excerpt was, um, was built to represent and to facilitate multiple senses to see um, and to feel and be with, with be with our work, um, and that was uh, primarily because of our relationship to that community. And that only happens when you actually are in the community, right? I mean, the legacies of folks who carpetbagging <laughs> coming into somewhere that you never been before. You 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 have to. It takes time. So I would say for everyone to yeah you know, begin to um, craft authentic curiosity and relationship with with.
people, uh, artists with disabilities, with uh, organizations that feature artists with disabilities, um, I think you'll find that there's more synergy with your work and, and, uh, and your sense of artistry. It's not as um, quote unquote alien as you think. Uh, I think we're going to wrap up because we only have two minutes left. So um, is there anything that anybody here wants to say that they haven't had a chance to express or anything? No? Okay, well, I guess, you know, in, in wrapping up, I just want to say that, um, again, the thing to do remember about interdisciplinary practice is that the only way to do it is to do it. Um, but there are great examples, for example, these artists on stage, of work that you can look at. And I think a huge part of it is, I love what Jaron said, it's always about curiosity. You know, if you want to do this work, you can do this work. You, and, and often, building the path to building work that doesn't, hasn't been seen or doesn't exist actually alters the system. And so that like puts the power in your hand to kind of change the way things are. Jaron and I were talking earlier because the contracts that we're creating, um, that excuse me, that we're given by organizations don't actually reflect the work we're creating, and that's really key, you know, especially with to, you know to do with intellectual practice, but also you know in, in terms of your own work and and where that work is going to travel one day. So, you know, there it, there are so many resources out there, but also there are things that you you might want to chart. Um, and so the best way to do that is to look at the things that you admire and like pull pieces, but also realize that you are capable of, um, of changing systems and, of, and that interdisciplinary practice is sometimes one of the most exciting ways to do so. Um, so yeah. Thank you, Valerie. Thank, Thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you.